Thank you for where you brought us from. Thank you where you're taking us to. Hallelujah. Over mountains, through floods, through barren and dry land, you kept us. Hallelujah. And for you, we praise your name. Lord, thank you for your blood, for it has not lost its power. Thank you, O God, for our way in and our way out. Thank you for healing. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you for another chance, another try. Hallelujah! We give you name of the glory. We give you name of all the praise. <laughs> oh God, move, heal, save. Deliver, Lord, right now, right now, oh God, go to those family members, those that are in surgery, those that are bound, locked up. Oh, yes, Lord, you're able. Lord, make a way out of no way. We're believing in you. We're trusting in you. We know that there is no name that saved like Jesus. Touch our children, those who are going back to school and those who have already started, those on their way to colleges and universities. Hallelujah! Protect our children. Hallelujah! Do it right now. Right now, Lord. Right now, Lord. And we'll give your name the glory. We'll give your name all the praise. And everybody said amen. amen. Put your hands together. Come on, put your hands. Hallelujah. Come on, stand to your feet. If you can. Hallelujah. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget no
be to John chapter number 14. John number 14. And we greet you in that wonderful, mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ to those that are here assembled at the Christmas Cathedral. To those that are assembled virtually by Facebook, Marco Polo, YouTube, we greet you in that wonderful, loving name of Jesus to our pastors, to our elders of this ministry. So good to see Mother Austin in the house, back in her place. Let's see, God has been just good. And to all of you that God has kept. John chapter number 14. I'm going to read in your hearing of this pivotal scripture on this August day, the eighth day. It is the day, of course, that the Lord has made. Bible tells us in verse number one, let not the heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there, ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus answered unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If he had known me, you should have known my father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? Philip, he that have seen me, have seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you? I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me. For the very works sake, verily I say unto you, verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And we thank God for the reading of the scripture and my topic for inspiration today is just ask. Just ask. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your people that are assembled here. We ask uh, in your precious name that you will bless your people, strengthen them, and give them strength 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Just ask. It's interesting. Uh, John chapter number 14 is a pivotal scripture in the life, number one, of the believer. Number two, the order of the world. And then number three, a message to the enemy. John 14 is so complete and the building scripture is John chapter number three. They are very much connected. John chapter number three, John chapter number 13, John chapter number 14. It creates what we call a doctrine of the Bible. A doctrine is a standard by which the body or entity must agree to and live by. Irrevocable, that means it cannot be reversed, and it is in error, that means um, it is not fallible. A doctrine is the foundation, it's the birthing of an entity, whether it's the church or whether it's um, a secular uh, entity or body. It provides within it doctrine that causes a group of people to go in a particular fashion. Doctrine is important, particularly in the scriptures, because we understand in the scriptures, through the Timothy and Thessalonians, and all scriptures are given by the inspiration of God, and it's profitable for a doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And so, doctrine is important. And it is important for a time period and also for the world so that they see something that is unique and different. What is also connected to John chapter 3, John chapter number 13, and John chapter number 14. Um, is another pivotal scripture. It's found in Romans chapter number one. The reason why I include Romans chapter number one, verse number 16, 15 and 16, is because it also creates a doctrine um, that is impenetrable. It means it can, and it's unrefutable. Paul said, according to the scripture and the writings of Jesus in John chapter number 14, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To the man that believed to Jew, Greek, Gentile. So he says the doctrine of Christ is power. It is also in Hebrews chapter number five and chapter number six. Paul then increases the confidence of the Jews that there are insalable rights, doctrine that cannot be refuted, doctrine of baptism, doctrine of death, the doctrine of salvation. And he mentions there in Hebrews uh, powerful, powerful scriptures. Jesus 
sets the doctrine and set the record straight. First of all, to his disciples. It is in John chapter number 13. Jesus is assembled in Jerusalem and the Passover has commenced. Passover is important. It's, 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 it's an activity. It's a calendar event that is so different than any other of the 12 or 13 Jewish holidays. Part of it has to do with creation. Genesis chapter number one, Genesis chapter number two, God creates the world. And then on the seventh day, he rests. It is believed that this creation of uh, what the Hebrews call, or, or, or what Biblicists call Bofu, it is the creation, the foundation, creation, the foundation of the earth is in the beginning, God, that God created the heaven and the earth. That is impenetrable. People are asking, how did the world come? And if there was a God, then who created him or her? And the Bible lets us know clearly that this doctrine of creation, before there was anything, God existed. It is in Hebrews chapter number five, chapter number six, that Peter or Paul suggests that before the world was created, God existed. That is a biblical, infallible truth. That there was nothing, not even time, not anything, not space, nothing existed that God had not created. So there was nothing before God. There is an antiquity, nothing after God. Even Jesus states this in the scripture, Revelation chapter number one, when John saw him in a vision, he wakes up and he looks and he falls as a dead man in Revelation chapter one. Jesus tells John the Revelator to get up. Who am I? I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. Jesus said, I was dead, but I am alive forevermore. The Passover is considering an important cause. It establishes a historical record to the Jews of something substantial. Uh, that happened for them and to them. It is in Exodus now, chapter number one, chapter number two, chapter number three, that God establishes his relationship with the Jewish nation. Tells them, I am going to be your God. I will fight for you. And to prove that I will fight for you, I'm going to bring you a typical, a typology, uh, a, a deliverer. His name shall be called Moses. He's going to deliver my people, help them and lead them to a promised land. In this chapter 2 and 3 of Exodus, God is establishing the Passover, which is so important says you've been enslaved by the Egyptians for nearly 400 years. I'm going to deliver you by my right hand. It will be unequivocal. There will be no question that the only person that could deliver Israel out of the hand of Pharaoh shall be God. As we begin to study um, Exodus prior to uh, the 30th chapter, God begins to fight for Israel. Fights for Israel by a typology, a Christ, an anointed one. And he uses Moses to prove to Pharaoh that there is only one 
God. One God indivisible. There is only one God. What? And this detail. Somebody here today, I know that there are a lot of preachers who are saying there are many ways to God. There are many gods. But the Bible says there's only one God. Beautiful. We call him Yahweh. Call him Savior. There is only one God that we worship. One God that we praise. One God that we give the glory to. And it's in Exodus. Tell the Israel when I delivered you. I've sustained you in your problems. I've sustained you in your slavery. But when I deliver you and you get on the other side of the bank of the Red Sea, I want you to give my name the praise. I want you to get some tambourines. And I want you to get the dancers together. And I want you to get Mary up together. And I want you to sing my praise. But I let you know that if you need to be delivered, you don't need a doctorate degree. You, you don't need a master's in undergrad. You don't need money. But Jesus shall deliver you. He shall be your mighty door walk. A mighty fortress is our God. So it is here in the Passover, God uses uh, uh, pestilence and disease. He gives it to the world, he gives it to Pharaoh. Uh, in the city of Pharaoh, Cairo, Alexander, but uh, God's people were protected. He then tells them that I want you to go through these issues. I'm going to define and to describe who I am. God is a noun, but he's also an adverb. And he's an adjective. My God, those an adverb modifying a verb. A mighty fortress is our God. He is a bulwark that never, well, never fails. He's an adjective. An adjective modifies a noun. He's a mighty God. He's a healing God. He's a great God. He's an omnipotent God. He's an omniscient God. Hallelujah. But he's also a noun. He's a person. He's not a thing. He's a person, my God. He can be a place and he can be a thing too. Oh yes, he is a person. He is a God that can feel our trouble. That can feel our distress. That can feel and know what we're going through. So he says, I'm going to deliver you. When I deliver you, I'm going to allow a deaf spirit to come through each. And when this deaf spirit comes, I want you to put some blood on your doorposts. And when the, the deaf spirit, which is named Apollyon, in the Greek, Apollyon, when the deaf spirit comes, it will see uh, the blood of the Lamb. And that spirit will pass over your house. My God, what am I trying to say? Many of us, not because we've been so good. It's not because you owe me anything and I owe you anything. No, no, no. It is that when we come to church, that we owe God a praise. Give it to somebody. It don't matter if the sanctuary is full or is empty or if pastor is here or not. We owe God a praise. Why do we owe him a praise? It's because it was God that passed over us. It was God that protected us. There was a God that sustained us. I want some of you that are in here right now, just take a memory walk down memory lane. Yes, three years ago or four years ago, you remember the condition and the situation that you were in or just remember last year. It looked bad. It looked horrible. It looked like the devil was going to steal your home and steal your job and steal your money. Steal your 
I, I watched it. I have a, 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 a farm that's across the road and, and they raise lambs. And so the only time that those lambs are born is at the beginning of the spring, which is between uh, in the February, March, parts of April. They are born and it's during the Passover. And it is Jesus that is called the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. This is what John saw when he came out of the wilderness to be baptized by John the Baptist. And John said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Now, he could have said a wolf, he could have said a dog, he could have said a cow, he could have said a lion, but he said the Lamb of God. And so, Jesus was the Lamb, and lambs are born during the Passover. And so, he was born during the Passover, and now he's getting ready to be crucified during the Passover. And here, Jesus is assembled with his disciples, and he's saying, look, I'm getting ready to go away. John chapter number 13. He tells them unequivocally, I'm preparing a place for you. Hallelujah. I don't want you to get comfortable here in Jerusalem. I've got to go away to prepare a place. And there I am, you may be awesome. He says, but you need to understand that before I can go away, there's going to be some horrible events. There are some things that are going to shake your faith. That's going to make you think what in the world is going on. He said the Son of Man, the Lamb of God, is going to be offered up. And, and he's going to suffer great, great atrocities for the world. It is in chapter number 13. He tells them, but understand this, that the giving away of the Son is going to be an inside job. He said there is someone amongst us that's going to betray me, but it is to the working of God. He gives them a last supper, and he, he, he takes some wine, some wine, some Passover wine that had not been necessarily fermented, and he gives them bread, and he breaks the bread, bread that did not have yeast in it, and he gives them the cup, and he says, number one, I want you to drink this wine. Because this wine is the New Testament of my blood, the blood of my New Testament that is recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. He says, this blood will represent me. And then he broke the bread and he said, this is my body that has been broken for you. I am not only the Lamb of God and the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I am the bread of life. Oh, can I tell somebody right now that if you want deliverance, and if you need to be saved, the God that I serve is the God that will heal you of your alcohol. You don't have to drink and come to church. You don't have to smoke and be full. I was talking to a brother the other day, and he says the marijuana cures me, and it calms me from my stress and my anger, and that's why I smoke it. And I said, brother, you don't need a past act. I said, all you need is the joy of the Lord. I said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I want to tell somebody here, you don't need to drink to have a good time. And you don't need to get drunk to waste your problems. I dare you to call on the name of the Lord. For the Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong time. And the righteous run in. And they are saved. Somebody put your hands together and say, I trust in the Lord. The song says, some trust in the horses, some trust in chariots, but I will remember the name of the Lord. 
for when I'm in trouble and I don't know what to do, I remember the name Jesus. He's a strong power. He's a deliverer. He's a savior. In the name of Jesus, he says, somebody is going to betray me. Uh, he says, but don't worry. He says, now the person that's going to betray me, he's going to take a piece of bread and sop it in a bowl. And it was at that time Judas took a piece of bread and sopped it in a bowl with the gravy and began to eat. Uh, and after that, the Bible says uh, when Jesus says that someone was going to betray me, the Bible says that very hour, uh, Satan entered the Jews. Uh, now I want to tell you this right now, uh, that the only way that the enemy can get inside of you, uh, you got to open a door. Uh, there's got to be access. Uh, or somebody say access. As long as you keep the door closed, the devil can't come in. But the access is this. Jesus said, if you believe, you can have whatever you ask for. If you believe, no matter what storm or hell comes your way, I will abide in you, and you will abide in me.
The devil said you were disqualified. And God opened the door. Jesus said, all I need you to do is ask and believe. Most of our trouble come because we are so intelligent that we attempt to rationalize the condition in the situations. Let me explain to you. Crime in America has gone up 70% all over America. In rural areas, suburbs, in the city. People are swearing at each other. Yelling. Families have come apart. Somebody ought to say amen to that. After being together for over a year, you would think we would learn how to get along. But being secluded, it magnified the issues of the family. Children not talking to fathers, not talking to their mothers. Siblings not talking to each other. I was looking and reading an article on yesterday that violence getting on airplanes have tripled. People can't, they've been stuck and secluded for so long that their equilibrium is off. I was out on Tuesday running a few errands and Wednesday. I was pumping some gas at a particular place in the world setting. And as I was pumping the glass, the gas, the music was playing in my automobile, not loud, just, just, just enough that my son shades on. And as I was pumping the gas, there was a person across who was also pumping gas. He said, you need to cut that off. It's a public place. And I looked up and I said, I'm sorry, sir, that is disturbing you. He said, I don't want your apologies. Just cut it off. And I took my sunshades off. And immediately he opened his jacket. And he said, what are you going to do about it? A conversation over music went from it being too loud. He didn't put it, but he showed it to me. That violence seems to be the way we are trying to answer everything. I am I'm convinced that this virus, COVID, variant COVID, is still here because we have not learned some lessons. Some of it is extremists, of course, on both ends 
kind of fueling. But we're fighting over masks. Folk are fighting over masks. Folk are fighting over, over a theory, critical race theory. Fight, literally, argue. Christians fight. And one of the pastors said this earlier today. The answer is love. When people throw hate to you, what do you throw back to them? When people yell at you, Jesus said, just ask. Thank you. 